OK, well, welcome, everyone, to, to our final ASC keynote. And I'm extremely pleased to introduce Duke University Distinguished Professor of Environmental Economics, Dr. Marty Smith, who earned a PhD from UC Davis in Agricultural and Resource Economics. Marty has made economics exciting and understandable to a range of biologists and environmental policy specialists. But he's also convinced a lot of mainstream economists how incredibly interesting the issues that we deal with in marine resource economics are. He has over 100 publications, including Nature, PNAS, Science, and the most distinguished economics journals. He was the editor of Marine Resource Economics. He's the, currently the president of the International Institute of Fisheries Economics and Trade and has made a wide range of contributions to, to our field. Marty was a role model for early career development where he focused on one fishery and explored a wide range of techniques um, and answered a lot of interesting questions. And then he's, as he's become a more senior economist, he's taken those skills and many others and applied them to a wide range of, of fisheries, making cutting edge contributions, continuing to make cutting edge contributions in bioeconomics, but also a diversity of other topics, especially the economics of coastal climate change adaptation and the economics of global climate markets and trade. Marty's an economist economist because he's methodologically rigorous and creative and he's explored just an incredible range of interesting topics. But he's also a great musician and he has a good sense of humor, especially for an economist. I think the last time that we were together, he was leading renditions of, of great songs on the bus back from the North American Fisheries Economics Conference. Uh, and I'm really sorry that, that we're not together at the conference dinner tonight to have you do that again. But nonetheless, I'm thrilled that you're with us today to, to present a keynote. Um, without further ado, um, Dr. Marty Smith, who's gonna present a keynote, Value and Regulation in Global Seafood Markets. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. And if you can give me a thumbs up that you can hear me okay. Awesome. So I also wanna thank uh, my many collaborators over the years, especially the folks listed here who contributed to the research uh, that I'll talk about today, as well as um, thanks to my generous funders over the years. The central question for today that I'm focused on is how do we generate the most value from finite ocean resources? That is an old question in economics, in fisheries economics, but I wanna breathe a little new life into it by looking at it differently by talking about the way the seafood market context really matters a lot that's been underemphasized to a great extent. So fisheries economics and seafood market analysis have largely evolved as parallel intellectual traditions. But understanding how to get the most value from those finite ocean resources really requires that we combine them. We have to tie these intellectual traditions together and draw on both of them. So today I'm gonna to have three take home messages. The first, hopefully you're already on board with, but I wanna give you some examples. Understanding incentives is essential to avoid management failure. The second is a little more subtle, and that's that the form of management actually affects the patterns of capture fisheries exploitation, the types of products that come out, and therefore the opportunities to generate value. And the third really is gonna build on that second one, which puts heavy emphasis on price, price incentives in capture fisheries, and thus the potential responses to management really depend on that broader market context. And as much as we may not like it, that includes that broader context of competition with farmed fish. So I'll start with a little bit of conceptual background just to paint the picture of how these two intellectual traditions have evolved differently. In traditional fisheries economics, the kinds of questions we ask are, what are the optimal dynamic paths of the stock, the harvest, and the associated fisheries uh, fishing effort? And often that's then compared to the unmanaged system, open access. How, how do these optimal trajectories compare to that? How much would we get if we switch to the optimal? And then, of course, a suite of questions that those of us in the policy sphere are most interested in are how do we get to those optimal paths using policy instruments? And these are some of the iconic figures that come out of that traditional fisheries economics, just uh, depicted at the bottom there. But in seafood market analysis, the traditional focus is very different. We're much more interested in this person sitting down here at this table deciding what to put on his or her plate. 
This person is deciding uh, how much they care about various attributes of the fish that they may or may not consume. So if seafood market analysis focuses on things like the seafood demand, market integrations, how are different markets for different seafood products connected, and the seafood trade. How much do consumers value things like the species they're eating, the fish size, the freshness, country of origin? How much do they value eco labels and sustainability claims? How much do they value farm versus wild? So I will promise only one slide with equations, but I'm doing it just to illustrate a point of just how different these intellectual traditions are. Here I've depicted one iconic model from each tradition. On the left is fisheries economics. This is the dynamic open access model due to Vernon Smith. We're not gonna go through all the details. The key thing to notice is the color coding, the stock in blue and the price in red on the left. Now this is originally due to Vernon Smith, but let me just say this model is still very much in use today, including in a recent paper that I did with Chinran Lee, in which we used a whole bunch of iconic models to examine how well catch-based metrics of collapse perform. And uh, as it might come as no surprise to most of you, all of those showed that catch-based metrics of collapse are basically vacuous. They provide almost no information or wholly unreliable. But that's a story for another day. What I want you to get out of this picture here is that the price in traditional fisheries economics is typically fixed and exogenous. In other words, it's determined outside the system. So you can see P in red there is just listed as a parameter, as is, it's just some price that happens to be there. Whereas the emphasis, and you know, many would say rightly so, the emphasis is on the fish stock, which is endogenous. Now this is a simple logistic growth model, but the fish stock you can see in blue is actually a function of what's going on inside the system. It's determined inside the system. Now, turning to the seafood market analysis, this is one example of the hedonic model that tries to parcel out how the price of a resource depends on its attributes. This is due originally to Rosen in 74, and again, still very much in use. Julia Braunman and I and other colleagues used it to study a small isolated market in Namibia, seafood market in, in Namibia. But what you see here is that price is in blue because it's the thing that's varying and endogenous, whereas the fish stock is exogenous. And in fact, in this particular model, it's not only determined outside the system, it's not even modeled at all. So those are very different pursuits. Now, before we get into the, the prices and the context a little more, I wanna talk about how important it is to understand incentives in, uh, to avoid management failure. The first simple point is that the world does not work like this. You don't put regulations in and then simply get biological, economic, and social outcomes. Instead, the world is more complicated. You regulate, but regulations actually affect incentives. Incentives are mediated by socioeconomic forcing, things like unemployment, or biophysical forcing, things like climate change. And those incentives in turn affect the behavior of people who fish for a living. Fishing behavior then affects biological, economic, and social outcomes, which in turn feeds back on regulation. So the world's not like this, but it is much more like this. And that means we have to pay close attention to how our regulations affect incentives. And we've got a whole host of experience of not doing that. So one of the classic papers in fisheries economics is due to Francis Homans and Jim Weiland in 97, in which they showed quite definitively that controlling harvest is simply not enough. Here, a season closure to control mortality actually generates more economic waste than pure open access. And the, meth and the reason this happens is that the shorter season, in order to enforce the total allowable catch, leads to more vessels entering the fishery to catch the fish faster. That leads to the regulator needing to shorten the season again and in a vicious cycle. And in this picture on the right, uh, in this picture on the right is an illustration of that from the sable fish fishery. Um, but uh, Holmans and Weiland also used this model to study North Pacific halibut. And the, what comes out of that is economic waste in the form of excess cost. 
even though you're holding the stock at a desirable level, you're generating all this economic waste because there's far too much effort that's been stuffed into the system as a result of the way you've regulated. And this leads to sort of a stylized description of how fishery management has unfolded in many settings. You start with open access in the unmanaged system and you get bad biological outcomes in dark blue and bad economic outcomes in light blue. When you switch to some sort of regulated open access or restricted access, you can get the biology to come back and maybe manage at sustainable levels biologically, but you can exacerbate the economic waste that's in the system and actually contribute to worse economic outcomes. But if you look further down the road, as many economists think, if you put cash shares into place, you get the benefits of both. You get the good biological outcomes and the good economic outcomes. Now, this is an active area of exploration in, in the literature right now. To what extent does this stylized description actually come true for cat shares? But I don't want you to be left with the notion that, it, uh, that management for purely biological objectives necessarily achieves those biological outcomes. So ignoring incentives isn't just perilous in terms of generating good economic outcomes, it can compromise the very biological outcomes that are desired. And this is an example of a paper I did with my former student, Junji Zhang, and the biologist Felicia Coleman in, uh, in GEME in 2008, where we show that accounting for behavior actually reverses conclusions about a spawning season closure in the Gulf of Mexico gag fishery. Gag is a species of grouper that's a protogynous uh, from Aphrodite. And there was a great deal of concern about fishing pressure uh, depleting the males and the large fish in the population. So if you model all that with a management model where you actually delete the effort by putting a spawning season closure in, um, what you see is in that model that yes, the spawning season closure would appear to reduce effort, reduce catch, increase biomass, increase big fish, increase males. End of story, must be a winning policy, right? Wrong. If you actually look at what people are doing, you econometrically model the fleet and how it behaves in response to all the economic conditions and the policy itself, you build that directly into that very sophisticated age-structured uh, life history model that accounts for the sex-changing fish and, and everything, you build the economics in and all the conclusions reverse. The effort actually goes up, the catch goes up, biomass, big fish, and males all go down. And the reason for that is that the substitution of fishing effort into other parts of the season actually doesn't just offset the policy, it more than offsets the policy. So this policy is a big loser, and it's a big loser because there was no attempt to directly model and understand the behavior of the fleet and how it responds to incentives. So that brings us to our next point. The form of management affects the patterns of capture fisheries exploitation, the types of products and opportunities to generate value. So let's go back to Holmans and Weiland again, and this time it's their 2005 paper where they also look at the Pacific halibut fishery, but they add a little twist here. So the shortened season to enforce the TAC, more vessels enter, shorten the season again, but here they note that something is happening on the market side that's very consequential. More of the product is actually frozen instead of being sold fresh. And of course, we all know that frozen fish is lower value than fresh fish, if it's really truly fat, fresh. And so essentially what this does is it generates economic waste on both the cost and the revenue side. In other words, there's excess entry of vessels on the cost side generating waste, but there are rents left on revenues left on the table in the form of you could have sold some of that fish fresh. And lo and behold, when cat shares were formed in this fishery, the season stretched out and a lot, a lot of Pacific halibut began to be sold fresh year round, and you can find it in pretty much any Whole Foods just about any day of the year now. This finding's also consistent with um, the Grafton Squires and Fox empirical work in 
uh, uh, on the transition to cash shares in British Columbia on halibut as well. So speaking of product form, you can see this even in uh, other examples as well. So here's an example where we can trace out uh, the progression of management for the Norwegian herring fishery. And what you see is that the rights-based management, the transition to catch shares where you divvy up the, the some sort, you create some sort of individual quotas, that that transition to catch shares actually leads to pumping more product into the high value use. So in this figure, what you see in red is the low value use, which is the reduction fishery. That's the industrial use, pumping it into fish meal, fish oil, and so forth. Um, the blue is the high value use, that's human consumption. So think all that just delicious pickled herring that you can eat for breakfast in Scandinavia. That's the high value use. What happens here under open access is you see most of the product going into the low value use, but of course this fishery is in decline and catches are declining. When management goes into effect under restricted access, it takes some time, but eventually the fishery starts to rebuild. But when it rebuilds, as it begins to rebuild, more of that product starts to flow into the low value use again. And it's not until you form the new rights-based system that that product Continue, starts to flow back into the high value use as, the mo as most of the product, and you also rebuild the fishery. So behavior change is critical in all of what I've told you so far. So let's actually explore that in detail. Do catch shares systematically lead to behavioral change? In other words, does it, does it stop the race to fish. We explored this for all catch shares fisheries, uh, catch share fisheries in the United States, so 39 of them, for which we actually had monthly data available and could actually look at the stretching or the contraction of the season. And what we did for each fishery is that we matched those fisheries individually with another fishery that was identical or very similar in another region that did not receive the, the policy treatment and then looked before and after. And what you can see here, the red dots are the point estimates. These are all indications that the season spread out with the, the blue being the 95% confidence interval. But you also see a lot of variability across fisheries and you even see some counterexamples. Now, when you pool it all together, you get an average treatment effect of a lengthening of the season as a result of catch shares by about 0.8 months. But it does beg the question, if this is the theory, if this is really what's going on or the only thing that's going on in the fishing behavior, why would you get these counterexamples? And we'll return to that in a second. But this is about how incentives affected behavior. And in fact, the new policy caused a very marked behavioral change in these fisheries. Did that behavioral change actually generate the revenue benefits that are predicted in the Holmans and Weiland framework here, we actually look into this using those same sets of fisheries with difference and differences, where we use the fish price in index by um, Sigbjorn and Sveteris et al., and, including me and, and others, um, as a counterfactual. So we use that to say what the price would have done. And we find that on average, yes, there are there is evidence for revenue benefits, but those benefits are not ubiquitous. So you can see that there are more fisheries with positive price effects in blue than ones with negative price effects in red, but most fisheries have no price effects or at least very small negative or positive ones. So definitely there's evidence in favor of this, but there is more going on in the system than immediately apparent from that fairly straightforward story of, yeah, we'll just catch, we'll stretch the season out and we'll get higher prices. So to understand this a little bit more, we're going to turn to um, to the um, oops, sorry, we're going to turn to Norway's uh, groundfish fishery, and in the Norwegian groundfish fishery, um, we're going to have some of the same species that we catch in uh, catch share fisheries in the United States and New England: the cod, the saith, and the haddock. The saith we call Atlantic pollock in in the U.S. Um, what's important? To know at the onset here is that cod in this complex is the high value species 
It's not always sold fresh, but it can be and often is sold fresh. And therefore, its price, despite global whitefish markets, is endogenously related to the pattern of landings across the year. Safe is like the polar opposite. It's a low value species that almost all of it is frozen. And therefore, the price is really taken as given. Whether you, whenever you land it doesn't really matter because it's all frozen anyway. So its price is exogenous and haddock is somewhere in between. And you can see in these pictures down here, you can test your own uh, culinary skills. One is cod and one is haddock. Both of them were delicious at a restaurant in Bergen. Multiple species. We model this multiple multi-species incentives and the transition to cat shares. We actually have an answer for the puzzle. Why would some fisheries speed up their fishing and others slow down in, within the same complex? And here what you see is there are strong incentives to spread out the endogenous price fishery. So think in blue, think cod, and strong incentives to concentrate the exogenous price fishery, think orange, think safe. And that, those incentives are much more pronounced when you have catch shares in the bottom panel here, but less pronounced in the regulated restricted access where you have incentives to race to catch those fish. So when you look at this and look at the Gini coefficients, which is a measure of how spread out things are, you actually see in this simple numerical example that you would expect to see the cod fishery spread out as a consequence of catch shares and the safe fishery become more concentrated. In other words, what would appear to be more racing. We empirically look at this as well, but this uh, numerical model answers the puzzle, why do some fisheries speed up in response to catch shares? And our empirical findings basically are consistent with all of the mechanisms that come out of that numerical model. The high value species cod is more spread out than the lower value species, haddock and safe, the species also are landed in reverse order of value. Say, then haddock, then caught. If you didn't have some secure right to catch the fish later, you would never do this. This would make no sense. Only with the security of knowing that you could catch that cod later, would, could you afford to delay to catch that cod. We also look at uh, this fishery from the perspective of uh, more effective fishing. In other words, you know, it, is it possible that even after controlling for the stock and uh, the amount of fishing effort, that the effort itself is more effective under catch shares because you are no longer having to race to fish. This is theoretically laid out very nicely in work by Matt Reimer, published in MRE. Uh, and methodologically, we explore this, um, the same thing that we used in, in uh, a paper uh, in Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences and Review of Economic and Statistics to basically say when catch shares go into effect after controlling for everything else, does the production relationship get more favorable in, in green compared to the blue or does it get less favorable in red compared to the blue? And to do this, we do difference in differences comparing a treated group, large coastal vessels in Norway, compared to a control group, small uh, coastal vessels, before and after the policy change. So the small vessels didn't get the policy, the large vessels did get the catch share. And we find positive and significant effects for cod, safe, and haddock. Fishing became more effective after the policy change, even after controlling for the stock and everything else. And for economists in the room, these results pass parallel trends results and placebo falsification tests as well. Fishing became more effective. Now, there are other ways of dialing in management on ways of increasing value that we can learn a lot from uh, looking at something like the shrimp fishery. Shrimp are like dynamics uh, that are sped up because it's, a, it's an annual species, warm water shrimp is an annual species that grows from not even harvestable to harvestable size to jumbo prawns over the course of a year. So what we see in this paper is that when you actually estimate all the behaviors and all the incentives that are in the system, you could, you could generate 49% more profits for the fishery by putting in effort quotas that are bi-weekly. 
And when I say 49% more profits, I want to remind everyone that that's a 49% increase in the livelihoods of the people that participate in this fishery. That's a huge change for people who by and large are not well off. How would you do it? You would do it generally by dialing back the effort early in the season, and in some cases, increasing that effort later in the season, which is here in the upper left, but some of the time you would actually uniformly dial back effort throughout the season. Not uniformly, of course, you see there's a lot of variability in what you would do. Now, why is that? It's a combination of shrimp life history because they're growing within the season. Okay, so you're getting more biomass over the course of the season if you could wait. More efficient vessels fishing on light days. So a lot of what's squandered in this fishery is some of the inefficient vessels are fishing on days when nobody should be out there or very few vessels should be out there. And size-based pricing. So we don't observe size-based pricing in North Carolina, but we know from work that I'm gonna show you in a second on Gulf of Mexico, that this is a huge effect. So you can think of these, this 49% as an amalgamation of all those effects. If you pay close attention to the behavior and incentives, you could dial in management that generates a lot more value. So that brings us to our last point, which is the price incentives in capture fisheries, and thus the potential of the uh, responses to management depend on that broader market context, including competition with farm fish. And shrimp, of course, are, uh, are, are the poster child for this competition with, with farmed. Uh, it is an example of a, uh, of a seafood market category that has tons of market integration. There's lots of supply coming from both capture and aquaculture. It's heavily traded internationally, and these markets are very closely connected. But at the same time, there is a very strong desire and pushback for market segmentation. Some of that segmentation is just the size-based pricing. I'll show you in a second. But some of it is attempts to sell differently, sell by the roadside, brand things like wild American shrimp and so forth and so on. But the reality, the starting reality for shrimp that managers generally are not taking into consideration enough to generate value is that the market values larger animals, fewer individuals for the same amount of protein. And here you can see from our PNAS paper in 2017, just how shocking this pattern is. You can see the price per pound of shrimp for the different size categories, ranging from these giant ones, less than 15 shrimp per pound, all the way down to the tiny ones, smaller than cocktail shrimp, 50 to 67 shrimp per pound, that this, these prices all move together, and yet they span half an order of magnitude in the price per pound. Now, you see this in all over the place in fisheries that the larger animals fetch higher prices. And you also see this in sort of headline giant bluefin tunas that get you know, $3 million equivalents for, for one fish, $2,228 per kilogram. So that pattern of larger individuals is hugely important. But when you create an index, in other words, you account for the quantities of those different things, and you compare domestic shrimp in the US and, and imported shrimp, which is almost all farm shrimp coming from Southeast Asia and South America, when you do that comparison, you see the prices move exactly together, I mean, almost exactly together. Imported shrimp are making up almost 80% of the U.S. market despite a large domestic fishery. They are driving the price, and it's that farm imports that's driving that price, and you can see how these prices are moving together. But what's also a little bit hard to swallow and maybe surprising to many people is that the imports are actually more valued over time, um, despite some pushback from attempts to segment. And that's not something that is very intuitive to people, but here we actually estimated this in recent work with Adla Oglund and, and Frank Asha, we see that the domestic share parameter, we estimate this in a demand system, is actually declining over time. It's sort of leveling off in the, you know, around 2000, mid 2000. So it hasn't continued to decline in the later part of our data set, but it's declined substantially. Why, why is that? Do people really like imported shrimp more than domestic? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. What people like is they like to go to Walmart and buy their shrimp 
They like to go to Red Lobster and have shrimp. They like to go to chain other, other chain restaurants. What are those big box stores? What are those big chain restaurants like to do? They like to buy year round, steady quality, steady supplies. Who can deliver that of the same kind of shrimp that goes into their dishes at the Red Lobster, whether it's popcorn shrimp or jumbo prawns, who can deliver that? Farm shrimp. And that manifests as a decline in the preference for domestic shrimp in the United States. So shrimp markets, um, shrimp markets are so integrated that both domestic and the global supply shocks um, uh, yield at best short run price compensation. So we saw this in the PNAS paper that yeah, hypoxia, which actually changes the, the availability, it reduces the availability of large shrimp in the natural environment, does increase the relative price of large shrimp. But it's a totally short term effect. Imports adjust really quickly. And so there's not a lot of price compensation for the people who are fishing for a living. Similarly, or you know, kind of the flip side of this, I would say, is that shrimp early mortality syndrome, which had a massive hit to global shrimp production uh, and, and affected farm shrimp in, in Southeast Asia dramatically, but that also increased prices. And you can see it right here in this figure from a recent paper with Tess Pettish. You can see that it increased prices, but those price increases were transitory. So they lasted a little longer than the short run effects of the domestic supply shock like hypoxia, but nonetheless, the price compensation didn't last because imports adjust. The markets adjust really, really fast. So what is there to do? Well, the best you can do is to manage accordingly. The best you can do is to recognize this reality, recognize these strong patterns of markets that are import dominated and manage to try to generate the higher value, larger shrimp. To some extent, I would say Texas is doing this. Here you see nominal shrimp prices aggregated by Gulf State for brown shrimp only. So same species. And look at how these prices, they move together. But Texas shrimp are almost twice the price as Louisiana shrimp. It's not because the demand for Texas shrimp per se is higher. It's because they're larger. Larger Texas shrimp are not because of the natural environment, although that can play a role. They are larger because they don't fish in inshore waters. They don't catch the small shrimp. They let the shrimp grow larger. There's also a Texas offshore closure. So if other places could manage in this way, given the way global markets work, you could generate more value from these fisheries. Context also is coming into play in bluefin tuna. Will bluefin tuna aquaculture yield a conservation benefit? Um, we're used to the idea that shrimp and salmon, for instance, are, are fisheries in the United States uh, and in other parts of the world too, that have a very important, there's an important connection to the farm seafood world because the salmon farming industry and the shrimp farming industry are so large. We're not used to that idea in tuna markets, of course, because tuna farming is still fairly nascent, although there's a lot of tuna ranching. But what we see here is that uh, we explored this question of will bluefin tuna aquaculture actually shift out the supply and therefore reduce the residual demand that would have a conservation benefit. And we did this by estimating an age structured uh, model of, of bluefin tuna. Um, that accounts for the open access like behavior that's uh, in, uh, in the fishery. And what we see is that maybe expanding that supply uh, will have an effect, maybe a modest effect. But the reality is that bluefin tuna prices have declined mostly due to the changes in the availability and the substitutability of other species. So yellowfin tuna and big eye tuna are now competing for high grade sashimi tuna in ways that they didn't used to. We've also seen that the backward bending price has increased due to the effects of RFMOs. And that's what this figure is showing right here. The actual place, the price that would call forth overfishing in the absence of, of strict regulation has actually gone up over time because even though the RFMOs have not been fully uh, able to 
enclose the fishery, so to speak, they have made it much more costly to fish illegally and much more costly uh, to, uh, to fish at all for bluefin tuna in ways that have driven up that backward bending price. And so you can see two things happening, both the market context and the management that's happening are driving outcomes in the fishery. So you can't just look at the management alone and you can't just look at the market context alone. So I want to return a little bit at the very end here to the key lessons from aquaculture and how aquaculture growth, uh, uh, the things that enable aquaculture growth, namely control over the production process, leads to new products and the ability to generate value. Aquaculture is way out in front of fisheries in terms of saying, here's how you create more value in seafood supply chains. And this is a point that, that Jim Anderson really raised uh, so well in his, in his 2002 paper, Aquaculture in the Future, Why Fisheries Economists Should Care. And putting more uh, meat on the bones of this story is Frank Asha's 2008 paper, uh, Farming the Sea, in which you see this dramatic pattern of cost reductions of producing Atlantic farm salmon in Norway and how the price just goes right with it. So those innovations set a baseline against which that industry can innovate further and generate more value in other ways. More value by further reducing costs or changing the production process, or more value through innovation in the supply chain. So one way of further generating, uh, lowering those costs is genetic modification. And whether you like this or you don't like this, this is a reality that built on the innovations of selective breeding and the innovations in the salmon farming industry that set that baseline. So this couldn't have happened without the control of the production process that happened before. And when I say control of the production process, I want you to think in the back of your minds, how do we control the flow of products and which products are flowing to the market from capture fisheries? Because that is the kind of control that will be necessary to realize gains like this. And then of course, my very favorite example of this in, in aquaculture is the Salma Ra. Salma Ra is a company that figured out how to chill salmon to reduce its internal temperature and then delicately remove the pin bones, fillet it, get it as high grade sashimi salmon into vacuum packed and into Norwegian supermarkets the next day. It is a remarkably delicious product that built off of all these other innovations. It couldn't have happened without the innovation that came before it. Salmaran furthermore then says, well, now that we've got Salmaran in our grocery stores, let's take it a step further and make Salmaran snack packs by putting some ponzu sauce and sesame seeds in there and put it into 7-Eleven, home of the Slurpee. So this is a remarkable example of innovation that generates value on top of other innovations. So this is what capture fisheries ultimately are up against in terms of the competitive landscape. So just to review our key take home messages, understanding incentives is essential to avoid management failure. It's not enough to say management leads directly to outcomes. Management is always mediated by incentives. Incentives affect behavior and behavior affects management. Uh, outcomes and further management of the future. The forms of management affect the patterns of catcher fisheries exploitation, the types of products and opportunities to generate value, and price incentives in capture fisheries, and thus the potential responses to management depend on the broader market context, including competition with farm fish. So I will quickly flash these ref references. My slides will be available later, so you'll be able to track these references down as needed. And thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, Alan, for the invitation and the generous introduction. And I, I leave you with a picture of the Puget Sound that I, I took when I was uh, at the I, at the uh, IFIT conference in Seattle that Alan helped to co-organize in Alan's uh, stomping grounds there. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Marnie. Uh, yeah, that was a really convincing demonstration of how important it is to include economics and interdisciplinary management across all sorts of fisheries. Um, I think, you know, sometimes we come across as being evangelicals for, for catch shares <laughs> in, this, in this context. And Trish Clay has a, a, a comment or a question. 
Um, um, so, you know, it says that, that catch shares also have negative outcomes that some vessels switch from cruise shares to wages, often lower price, you know, lower wages as a result. Costs of entry rise, young people are less able to entry, crudely um, lose their off-season activities when the seasons are longer. Do you, do you have thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is this is a fantastic question because we we were charged to look into that those very issues with a recent um, National Academy of Sciences Engineering and Medicine report that was just released that I was a part of, a consensus study. And um, we were we were tasked at looking at particular catch share fisheries in the U.S. And what we found is that um, there are certainly anecdotal reports of some of those those concerns. But there's also evidence from other fisheries that, that go ag exactly against that. So for instance, uh, Josh Abbott's work um, on the Alaskan crab rationalization shows that that in fact didn't happen. And um, so it, you know, the questions of, of do catch shares actually make it harder for young people to enter the fishery, I think is a very open question. And it's a really important question that speaks to the issue of how do you design these programs? So many of the, the reservations about social outcomes like uh, employment aren't necessarily about the formation of, of a rights-based system and what it does to fishing behavior and um, the resulting effects on the value that's generated in the fishery. Many of the reservations have to do with exactly how you initialize the system, how you allocate quota in the first place. Those initial allocations are some of the most contentious issues when it comes to equity. So what I would say back to you is those are the places that we could, we could design differently. We could do things like, and we talk about this in the National Academy study, we could do things like um, allow people who worked as crew on fishing vessels to vest in over time so that when you create a new catch share program, those people would qualify for initial allocations of quota, even though they didn't own a vessel or own, own a permit. So that's one uh, example of a policy that we think should be looked into more seriously. Thanks. So another question from Jens Rasmussen. Given the state and awareness of climate change, do you expect that socioeconomic pressures, drivers on incentives and regulation will change dramatically? Can existing economic models cope with their currently tested parameter space within their <laughs> current, current Wow. Well, that, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a very tough one, right? Because we are all sort of in the business of staring into a crystal ball and, and trying to understand the many complex ways that climate change will affect fisheries and, um, and, and really the, the whole ocean economy. I would say that um, there are some benefits to certain forms of management like catch shares in the sense that the catch shares would follow the fish. So you don't necessarily tie yourself to existing geography in a way that, uh, that other forms of management might, might do. So that might create the flexibility for, for fish moving in response to ocean warming and things like that um, to have a more adaptive fleet. Uh, but I would also say that some of the things that are really, really difficult are um, the availability and you know, of, of port infrastructure and what kinds of places uh, from a coastal climate change adaptation perspective, what kinds of places are going to be able to continue to exist? What places will uh, simply be underwater? And so one of the things that I think is needed in all of this is a little bit more regional planning to think about um, where, are we going to, where are we going to defend? Um, where are we going to be able to land fish and have fish processing? And, you know, I think it's unrealistic to expect that an extremely geographically diffuse uh, model where, where all the traditional places that, that people have caught and landed fish um, for a living are gonna be able to be sustained under climate change. I think uh, regulators and, and managers are gonna have to make some choices about, about those, those locations. So that's gonna be a big part of this issue. In terms of the, you know, the parameter space, I mean, that is, uh, you know, that's kind of another really great question, but it's methodologically a, a huge challenge, right? Because in anything we do in economics empirically, you know, we're, we're always faced with the question of to what extent, uh, you know, has what we've been able to observe in sample, to what extent does it apply out of sample? And every time, um, you know, we, we investigate this theoretically, 
uh, you know, and one of the you know examples here was you know, that I mentioned in the paper was was Matt Reimer's work that you know that that was thinking about these transitions to cash shares and how people behave. But you can think about that that same kind of idea every time we investigate this theoretically. We see that there are a lot of limits on what what we can know from in sample. So I think it means that we have to be able to be flexible and and be willing to be wrong. I mean, we can't we can't assume that that if our model says we'll generate such and such benefits if we do this, um, that climate change won't, won't change that in, in some sense and that we need to continue to study it and continue to update our data. And I think that's the best we can do. Thanks. Um, I have another question for my fellow SIHD chair, Katel Hamon. Um, what, what do you think about more social allocation of catch shares as opposed to individually allocated? Um, I think it really depends on the fishery and the context. Uh, I don't have a particular, you know, particularly strong view that it, that catch shares should go to individual vessels versus um, versus cooperatives or groups of vessels. And I think it we have examples of of it working in in, in both ways. Um, I think that it's possible that some of the the kind of social allocations of catch shares might have a more favorable political economy in terms of getting getting the policy to happen. So if that's the case, I think that that you know it's certainly something you know something worth considering. But I will say the the you know analysis of the effects of cat shares on uh, you know from from the economist point of view becomes much harder. I mean if if you imagine like instead of individuals kind of that you know that are allocated shares and, and you know, you're studying their individual behavior in the fishery, you've got individual vessels that are part of these sort of sub cooperatives that are then part of this sort of meta uh, policy that's allocating. That becomes a much, much harder thing to study. And I, I know that um, some of the challenges of studying the Alaskan crab uh, fishery and its transitions to, uh, to catch shares in part has to do also with the formation of these these cooperatives after the policy went into place and, and what that meant about availability and data and understanding um, what the individual vessel behavior really means. Thanks. Um, I have one more, um, one more question and then I'm gonna, for those of you watching, I, I'm, uh, Marty has agreed to generously to spend more time talking and having questions. So I, I shared a, a Whova uh, link where, where um, he'll go shortly after this. and. But uh, just what you know, you, you've thought a lot about management and about seafood markets. And one of the challenges of, of global seafood sustainability is, is trying to, to regulate the, the flow through the global supply chain. What do you see as, as sort of steps that we ought to be taking to put the incentives in the right places to, to use the markets to help achieve sustainability? Yeah, so that's, um, that's a huge question. Uh, <laughs> I think you know, some of the things are um, transparency and understanding the, uh, excuse me, where your fish comes from and so forth. And, and, um, and, and I think there's a lot of potential out there to use blockchain technology to, to do that. But I also think that um, consumers are a little bit overwhelmed with the, the proliferation of information and the proliferation of eco labels. And I always like to tell this story of this, this old friend from college who used to say, you know, when I go to a restaurant, like I just I I can't tell what's the right fish to eat, so I just get the beef. And <laughs> I always think, like, what? <laughs> if you're you know you're so worried about the environment that your reaction is to get the beef because you know you're sort of stifled by this information overload and, and uncertainty, like it's farmed really that bad or what? So I I think some uh, you know we have to also be willing to think about like are there ways of sort of bundling some of this information that, that can give people a little bit more clear signals. Because right now, I think, you know, like so many other things, you know, with the internet and everything, people can find sort of anything they want to find about a particular seafood product or that could lead them to any number of decisions. And I think if you're going to get consumers to actually be a part of this, that some of that consolidation needs, needs to happen. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Marty. Um, I've been given the hook. To, we're we're uh, going to give people some space till the, till the next talk. But again, everyone, um, we're going to move over to the Whova chat and, and keep talking. Then, thank you very much for for the great talk. I appreciate your your time.